All right. So hello there. And uh, this is technically the first talk that we're having uh, with Max Sullivan, dispensing optician, um, glasses connoisseur, as you can see. <laughs> How are you doing, Tom? Um, right. I'm splendid. I'm fantastic. You good? Yeah, very well. Thank you, mate. Working hard, but no, very, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's just going to talk us through uh, ocular anatomy, an introduction to the eye. Lovely. And right, I'm just going to share my you? screen now, Tom, because I've got a few slides to go along with what I'm saying. So give me one second. Can you see my screen okay, by the way? I can see your screen okay, yeah. Lovely, perfect. Okay, Brent. So as Tom says, we're going to be going over just the instructions to the eye uh, and ocular anatomy. It's only going to be reasonably basic stuff, really. I'm not going to break down anything crazy uh, in depth. I uh, don't want to lose anyone. But of course, if anything needs to be gone over in more depth, you can always comment or ask uh, Tom for me to do something more, and we can always do that at a later date. Um, so if anything's needed, just comment uh, in, on whatever you're watching this on, and we can go from there. Um, I'll start just by leaving... An image of the eye itself here all labeled a cross section here for you and we're going to be looking at the majority of these parts of the eye here and a couple of little extras for you as well um, as i say if there's any questions or anything that i'm leaving out at all please do comment and we can get an answer back as soon as possible to you guys as well okay thank you so we'll start by looking at the, the pupil which the majority of people will know is the uh the black center part of the eye okay the pupil's there to allow light to come into the eye itself, okay? And what some people may or may not know is that the size of the pupil itself can change depending on the environment that you're in. Uh, the size of the pupil is controlled by the iris, which is the color part of the eye, which we will come on to in more detail uh, in a minute. Um, but more specifically, it's controlled by a muscle in the eye known as the iris sphincter muscle, okay? Now the pupil getting larger and smaller it does have names okay so when the pupil becomes larger that's known as myogiasis and um, that tends to happen in environments where light is quite low so when we're in a particularly dark environment for example the eye itself or the pupil i should say itself can start to get larger enable for more light to get into the eye sufficiently and the opposite of uh, myogiasis is meiosis, and that's when the pupil itself becomes smaller and contracts. And that will happen when there's almost too, too much light around and the eye doesn't need to let quite so much light in. Okay. Could, sorry, could, could I just uh, comment on uh, my myogiasis, was it, yeah? Yes, please do. Um, yeah, so, uh, so just obviously from a glasses perspective, uh, when you wear sunglasses, my dryasis happens to increase the amount of light that your eye can take in because of the reduced light. Exactly. Um, what you'll find is with the sunglasses itself, because obviously, of course, the lenses that's in front of the eye is tinted, yeah. that blocks some of the light coming in itself. Yeah. So what you'll find is sunglasses stops light, as much light, I should say, coming through the lens and hitting the eye itself. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's also that. why it's important to have the UV coating as well, isn't it? Exactly. That's for protection as well, more than yeah. anything. And we'll, we'll, I'll come on to talking about the lens and cataracts, that kind of thing as well. But oh, yeah. um, that's that's a big one. And you'll find that with all sort of sunglasses, it's really important to have them UV 400 coated. And a lot of your... Um, anti glare coatings nowadays will be UV coated as well. So that's just yeah. as important as well. But that's a, that's a great point uh, as well, Tom, um, with, your, with your specs there, not just sunglasses, but with your clear glasses as well, you're gonna wanna have your, your, your coatings on there as well for your protection. Uh, yeah. So no, that's, that's no bang on. Um, really that's the pupil covered. Um, moving on to the iris itself, which I very, very briefly mentioned just now. Now the iris is the colored part at the front of the eye, okay? And that is there to also help regulate the amount of light entering the eye itself, okay? Now the iris consists of blood vessels, pigment, and uh, muscle tissue. Now iris color itself, your eye color, um, is determined by the amount of pigment itself uh, that's there. Uh, and the cells that cause this are known as melanin, okay? Um, 
so that is really what determines what color your eyes will be is the amount of pigment and melanin that is available there okay mm -hmm. moving on briefly to the sclera now which is the white part at the front of the eye here now the sclera uh, mainly really is there for protection it's like a bit of a shield almost for the front of the eye stops any foreign bodies um, getting into the eye itself and causing any damage or harm stopping any nasty bugs getting in that kind of thing uh, and it also helps in maintaining the shape and structure of the eye itself so really the sclera the white part of the eye itself is there mainly uh, for protection and just to strengthen everything uh, i would say is the most important part of that there and as i've labeled here as best as i can that's the front white part of the eye itself okay Lovely. Now, a slightly more important part of well, all parts of the eye are important, of course, but a very important part of the eye, I should say, uh, is the cornea now. And as you can see, I've got a little bit more about that because it's you can go quite in depth on the cornea. I've tried to keep it as, as basic as I can, but there's quite a lot to know about this. And it's something that we can break down if, if people want us to at a later date. Um, but the cornea itself is a transparent outer protective layer from the globe, okay? And it is responsible for the majority of the eye's refractive power, okay? And what you'll find is the refractive power of a normal working eye is around 60 diopters, okay? And as you can see down here, the power of the cornea itself is around 48 diopters. So it's quite a vast, um, quite a powerful part of the eye itself and gives us a majority of that refractive power itself, okay? The cornea is, is roughly around half, um, half a millimeter in thickness. It's not particularly thick, but the cornea itself uh, is divided into six layers. Okay, it quite quite recently found it was six layers. We used to think it was five, and I think it was around seven years ago we we managed to find another layer in there. So, um, very very important part of the other cornea here, uh, particularly in contact lens practice as well. You'll find uh, this is this is pretty key. Obviously, this is the part of the eye where the cornea will sit. Um, sorry, where the contact lens, I should say, will yep. sit. So it's it's pretty in depth. We can go into these kinds of things, um, but that's sort of in a nutshell the cornea. Sorry, is it works. is it is it actually because of the uh, you know how it's not spherical? Yes, is it because of that, how the contact lens actually sticks to it as well. So, so that's it. So that, that, that'd be a number of things. So what you'll find is the actual curve of the cornea itself. So when we're putting a contact lens onto an eye. Now, I don't particularly work a lot in contact lens practice. Um, but what you'll find is we can change or I say order a different sort of radius and diameter that kind of thing of lenses yeah. so that we can find one that is the perfect fit for a person. So right. With a contact lens, it's not really a one size fits all kind of thing. We 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 will order different sizes, that kind of thing, in order to find the perfect fit. Um, but no, that's that's a great point, really. What you'll find is we need to find a lens curvature wise that fits the curvature of the front of the eye itself. Um, yeah. So there's that's why it's it's there's more to it than what meets what meets the eye really when it comes to contact lens fitting. Nice. As I say, I'm not um, I'm not sort of in myself personally into contact lens practice but no. um, it's there's yeah, this very interesting thing and with with that kind of thing when you're studying contact lenses um which i have done just not in the depth that some others will have um this is really the main part of the eye that you're looking at itself the cornea is um is the main part of it really so can you can you imagine how uh, excited those scientists were when they found that sick flyer as well? No, exactly. That was, I think it was 2013 um, they'd yeah. done that. And it was in a, a copy of a, an optometry magazine that, that first got published. And it was quite, yeah, it was quite a big thing because obviously we've been studying this for so many years now. And particularly yeah. the older generation of people that do this kind of thing, they've been spending all these years believing that there was five layers in the cornea. And then obviously they've got... Yeah change the way they yeah. think and, and their world's yeah. turned upside down by a sick <laughs> yeah. player that's it yeah <laughs> page yeah. turner of an article <laughs> <laughs> that's it yeah <laughs> but um so that really as basic as i can go that's the cornea and if there's any more interest in that we can go into it in more depth at a later date of course if we Definitely. need to um we can go into stuff like 
um, pathology of the cornea and, and how it can be affected by certain disorders, that kind of thing. If there is an interest in that, of course. Um, that, that oh, yeah, quite... disorders are always interesting, aren't they? And so... it's, that was probably the thing I found most interesting in my time studying is it's always yeah. ocular conditions is the thing that, that grips you. So we can we can always do something like that if necessary yeah. as well. But it's, it's stuff basically... that makes your stomach turn, but you still <laughs> want to look again. Essentially, that's it. Bang on, yeah. But that's yeah. um, as basic as I can go with the cornea. Um, oh. And that's that's sort of what what we've got there for you. OK, now moving through the eye now to the aqueous humor. OK, now this is a watery like substance that's found in the anterior and posterior chamber of the eye itself. OK, and the main job of the aqueous humor is to, well, one of the main jobs of the aqueous humor, I should say, is to enable and regulate ocular pressure in the eye itself, okay? And it's also key in transporting uh, nutrients like vitamin C, et cetera, around the eye. Now the aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary body in the eye, okay? And really the aqueous humor, I would say, uh, drainage of it itself, production and drainage of the aqueous humor is really, really important. Um, it's produced and uh, so yeah, produced by the ciliary body and it's drained through a system called the trabecular meshwork, okay? And what you'll find is uh, if we're sufficiently secreting aqueous throughout the eye, it helps to maintain the eye health itself. And if for any reason a problem arises with the aqueous flow throughout the eye, it can lead to certain issues. The main one, probably most commonly known, would be glaucoma, which is an increase in pressure in the eye itself, which can lead to um, trouble with your vision later on in life, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, the movement of aqueous humor, like the cornea, really is is really actually something I found quite interesting, and that's something that we can go over in another video in more detail if there's a if there's a desire to do that. That's quite an interesting one. I, I, would I certainly find this this one quite interesting. I find mm. it interesting because of uh, you know the the pretest that you do with mm, the yeah, with yeah. the puff of air. Yeah, you see a lot of like I've explained it to people on Instagram before. Um, uh, about how that works and uh and and how that measures the pressure mm. of the eye because um just just for our viewers um the the puff of air basically uh there's a laser that, that touches the front of the eye and bounces off at an angle and then the puff of air it flattens the surface of your eye and that laser will then bounce back like straight onto itself and it measures the amount of time, you know, in, in like nano milliseconds sort of thing, um, how quickly it takes to flatten that. And, and from that, it calculates the pressure of your eye. I thought That's that a, was quite an interesting. It's a really, really eye. good one. It's a really, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's in particular, it's something that I find really interesting. And doing, we could definitely, definitely do something about this uh, in, in the not so distant future, because this is something I find really interesting as well, Tom. And yeah, I mean, it's the amount of times I've been in, in practice and people have asked me what that puff of air actually is for. Um, I, I've explained this about a million times. and It's, it's just uh, to make your day fun. Exactly right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's not particularly an enjoyable part of the test, but it's, as, as, as you can tell with what I've just said, it, it's pretty important that we, we yeah. keep, um, keep checking us whenever you come in for your, um, for your eye test. So no, that, that's um, definitely something we can look into if, if, uh, if we need to or if people want us to for sure that's because i think me and tom will quite enjoy it because uh we've, <laughs> it's quite an interesting one yeah right so the vitreous humor is the next one and this is slightly different to the aqueous it's a it's a gel like fluid um located in the eye behind the lens which is this part here where i can got my mouse okay um and the, one of the important jobs this does is to help and uh, to support the shape and structure of the eye itself uh, and it also helps to transmit any light coming through the pupil to the back surface of the eye, which is the retina here. Okay, and we will go over these parts of the eye in, in a minute, but this is the retina here, the back surface of the eye, and it helps to transmit that light onto the back surface. Okay, now what you'll find is um, when we are younger and chil uh, children, the vitreous humor, the gel itself, is slightly cloudier or milkier, um, they tend to say. And as we move in, from, well, move from childhood to adulthood, that uh, gel, vitreous itself, goes from cloudy to slightly more clear, which makes our vision a lot clearer as well. 
um, which is actually something I didn't know until um, researching it further. So that was quite an interesting one. Um, the vitreous humor itself is mainly made up of sugar, salt, uh, hyaluronic acid, water and collagen. And the real a big difference between the vitreous humor here and the aqueous humor, which we just went over, is that the vitreous, well, there is a set amount of vitreous humor itself and it doesn't sort of move around the eye. We've just discussed that the aqueous humor travels around the eye itself, whereas the, the vitreous humor doesn't. It stays where it is and there is a set amount of it in the eye. Am, am I right in thinking as well of vitreous humour? Does, does that create just enough pressure to hold the retina against the surface? That's it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, bang on. So it helps to, to keep, helps to, um, yeah, as you write, um, as you say, hold that retina onto the back of the eye itself. Because um, I, I think with, uh, with a detached retina, they actually inject, inject like a uh, an artificial vitreous humor don't they uh, to I, don't, I think something, something along like that. those I, lines yeah, something along those lines again that's something that i can definitely go and go into more detail and get back to you yeah yeah like that for sure 100 percent. but i know you can also get vitreous detachments as well where over time oh, wow. the um over, more over time you tend to see it more in older people um the yeah. sort of the way it is in the eye the vitreous itself the viscosity of it changes and you can get a slight vitreous detachment and that's what some people will oh, describe yeah. as like a floater in their vision um oh yeah if it gets to the point where it's quite bad we can we can sort of look into this with surgery that kind of thing um but that's that's another part of the eye that's, that's pretty interesting i'd say and you're right when you say with the retina as well it helps to just keep that yeah. in place um so that no, that's a good one there and it's very easy to get this mixed up with the aqueous humor um, but I would say the best way to remember it is, is what I've said, that the aqueous humour will travel throughout the eye itself, whereas the vitreous humour will stay, or the most part, stay where it is um, mm. behind the lens. OK, I think um, I also because uh, just because you mentioned the retina and, and children, um, mm. I believe children's eyes are obviously because I think a lot of people think that eyes stay the same size throughout your life. But um, but I've also heard that, uh, you know, when you take a photograph of a child because their eye isn't as deep, you can actually see the reflection of the retina and that's what the red is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. bang on. Yeah, exactly right. Um, what you'll find is, let me shut this down so I can show you. Can you see my screen okay, Tom? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm going a little bit off topic here, so I apologise. But um, anyone that's watching this that's had an eye test, before would have had a fundus photo to take this here. Oh, there we go. Which is we do a photograph of the eye itself, which gives us a photo of the back surface of the eye, the optic nerve, the optic disc, that kind of thing. Uh, essentially, when we get the picture taken in the flash and you see the bit of red, it's essentially what we're looking at here. This is just, of course, a way, way more detailed version of of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've gone off topic a little bit there, but no, yeah, that's essentially what what we're talking about there. Definitely, Tom. Yeah, exactly right. Um, love the, lovely. Can you see what my screen again? Is that working? Yeah, yeah, vitreous. Fantastic. Humor. No, no, that's um, no. Essentially, that's yeah, no, bang on. So yeah, when we get your picture taken, you can see, um, you can see that kind of thing. Um, and we also take pictures of it as well in practice, but we just get a substantially more clear and in-depth image than what just your everyday camera would pick up from far away. But no, yeah, bang on. Exactly right, Tom. Yeah, I think I think we could probably do a, another session entirely on a retina. In fact, actually, I think to so be, yeah, I it. mean to be honest with you, I would say the, the majority of everything we're just going over quite quickly. You could probably do an, a whole video in itself on most of the stuff. Um, yeah. To be honest with you, um, it's a day. when I was studying, I said, yeah, when I was studying all this stuff, you'd you'd have, and I remember it really well. It wasn't it wasn't that long ago. Um, you would go into your lecture and you'd have a lecture for an hour or two hours about just one of these slides. So really what I've done here is just break it down into quite short and, and take yeah. out the really important bits. And of course, as I said at the start, if, if there's a real uh, desire for it to be gone over in more detail, I yeah, urge anyone just to comment and we can do that. Um, no problem at all. So yeah, um, no, definitely. So moving away from the virtue humor, we've got the crystalline lens um which is something that 
people, well, not a lot of people would have heard of, I would say, which is this part here in the eye. And it's a clear biconvex, as you can see, structure in the eye, okay? And it's responsible, we mentioned the cornea earlier on, being responsible for around 48 diopters of power in the eye. Uh, I, I did say that the eye had 60 uh, diopters of power and the other 12, degree, um, 12 diopters, sorry, comes from the lens here, okay? Uh, so then it's a very important um, in terms of us seeing um, as we do. It's also very important in accommodation itself. Now, accommodation is the eye's ability to change its power in order for us to see objects clearly at different distances. So if, for example, you're looking at the TV and then coming down to read a newspaper close up, that's when our eye accommodates for us to be able to see close up and then far away again. And that's something that unfortunately we do tend to lose as we get a little bit older and that we can correct with reading glasses. Um, and accommodation, as, we keep, as I keep saying, is another one that's really, really interesting. And we can go over that in, in a whole other video as well, Tom, if, if you'd like to do that as well, mm -hmm. um, we can go over accommodation. But briefly, what you'll find is when we're accommodating and looking at something closer, the shape itself of the lens will change. So what you'll find is it will go slightly fatter and wider, more bulbous, if you like, in order for the power of the eye itself to change so we can see the object that we're looking at from closer up. Um, as you can see, it's located in the eye's posterior chamber and it's made mainly uh, from clear proteins. Now the lens itself should be clear. However, with age, uh, the lens can start to become clouded. Um, and this is what people will know as a cataract, which the majority of people would have heard of or come across in their life, I'm assuming. Um, That's actually due to, to UV exposure, isn't it? That's it. So yeah, it go, goes back to what we were saying earlier with the sunglasses. Exactly right. And um, ties in quite nicely with that. So um, that's why when, when Tom says about how important it is to have the UV on your sunglasses, and this is what we're talking about, really, um, protecting the eye itself um, from the, the harmful rays that the sun can cause. Um, but it happens over time, so it can start to cloud this lens here. And what we can do if it gets to the point where it's really affecting a person's vision, we can perform cataract surgery where the old and clouded lens itself is taken out and is replaced with a clear sort of implant, um, which is really, really good because what we can do now, if there's a person who actually has a prescription sort of for their distance vision, we can take this lens out and replace it with an artificial lens that's got a bit more of a prescription in it. So in theory, they wouldn't have to wear glasses for their distance anymore which is really, really cool. And that's something I've seen quite a lot of with patients. I've I, think, seen. I think you can actually get cataracts a second time as well, though, can't you? Um, can you? Not that unaware. might be something no. to do a video on. Yeah, okay, that's another one we can get. We're going to have a lot of videos yeah, to do by the end. Yeah. But that's, that's um, all right. <laughs> but no, I don't... In the next 40 years. I don't think so. Not, not as far as I'm aware. Right, um, okay. That's something that I will... I, well, I'll tell you what I'll do when we finish this. I'll get straight on that, and you can just check it out. Yeah. You can comment underneath right. with that one there. Yeah, all right, no worries. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that's. I don't think we can do that. Um, but it's so, it's really cool. It's something that I've seen with with patients I've seen in practice, and when they come in, they've got these quite high prescriptions, and they they go off for their cataract <laughs> surgery. They come back three four weeks later, and they no longer need these big thick spectacle lenses because the majority of the work is now done by this new implant um so that's really really good it's really cool i think i think we actually uh you know back when we worked together um i think we actually had a patient who had uh you know like a prescription of like minus 23 or something yeah. he didn't have cataracts but he did have his lens uh replaced yeah i, I think it, like if i remember correctly um and and then his prescription actually went down to you know like minus six or something yeah which, yeah which is still a large prescription but actually you know if you, but the jump from the 23 to the six is, yeah it's, it's, it's like the difference between having a telescope in front of your eye and and you know like yeah not and, and what I'm wearing, essentially so yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it's really really good um what um, we'll find with this cataract surgery, if you go back quite a few years, you might have found a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but some people 
would have had their lens taken out but wouldn't have had anything replaced then those patients would have been called aphakic patients it's not something we see anymore it's very very outdated but what you'll find is if you was to run into one of these people nowadays that have really high plus powered lenses in order to make up for this 12 day optus that's just been whipped out of their eye um, so that's another thing oh, wow. that's, that's quite interesting. As I say, it's quite yeah, I outdated. Know about that. Something that we that I've not ever seen, and that I probably won't ever see. Uh, it's no, but you know about it. But it's, I mean, the information's out there if if, yeah. if it does ever happen. So that's that's a good one. And as I said, um, the lens is another thing that's that's, that's a really cool one. Um, the cataract is the, probably the main thing with the lens that people would have heard of. Um, yeah, I think that's quite common, isn't it? Yeah, you hear it a lot. Um, even just day to day, you hear a lot of people coming in and asking about their cataracts, and because people aren't wearing people. their sunglasses enough. <laughs> that's it. I'll, I'll have to tell people that from now on. <laughs> Keep that in front of back of my head. But um, that's the main. It worries people. But the the, the cataract surgery, it's in the grand scheme of things, it sounds pretty terrifying, but it's quite a straightforward thing. Really, quite a straightforward yeah. procedure. Um, it's quite a life changer as well isn't it yeah definitely for some people i mean my um it can affect when you've got the cataract it can affect sort of how bright you see the world as well it can affect colors that yeah. kind of thing um yeah. i've seen it with people when they sort of they had a if you've got like a yellow tablecloth for example on a white plate the, the difference it will distinguish in the, those two colors can be difficult so um yeah it, it can be pretty so it can even cause some sort of uh some form of like color blindness to a certain degree in a now. way in a way yeah it's, but it it's, wouldn't be counted as such no 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 it's yeah. more it's yeah yeah definitely it wouldn't be counted as that but i can see there's definitely a, a similarity between the two yeah sure. yeah definitely definitely right just uh quickly sorry no, just no, quickly no, no, before no, we go I, I just thought i'd explain the word biconvex just in case yeah no please do know I was about it actually, yeah uh so so biconvex it's basically like uh the bottom of a bowl on both sides you get uh convex is the outside of a bowl um you know like a like a hill um by is two so it just it just means that the lens is is convexed on both sides there we go. There we go. So I just convex. By concave, yeah, by convex. Lens. That that first one's perfect. That's it. So yeah. you've got the concave lens here and your convex lens. Um, concave lens here. Fantastic. Well, convex lens there, essentially. So. And then uh, and then one other comment on that on that uh, on that slide before we uh, move no, on. on, just because I think it's interesting. You'll find yeah, it's no, interesting. Definitely. So it's it's believed that uh, Tyrannosaurus rexes, they have. Um, I don't know what it would be called, but like with their pupil, they've got this this sort of gristly bone uh, right. that that shuts almost like a sci-fi door. Um, yeah, but it's basically so that they can go from seeing ten miles away across flat plains to seeing right up next to them within a split second. No, right, okay. And it's, and it's yeah, it's uh, it works. You know those pinhole glasses. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember we used to have some Yeah, so it, it, <laughs> works, yeah. it works similar to that, I guess. Like, it, it would just be a matter of reducing the amount of light in a, in an instant. Yeah. Yeah, pinhole glasses are, are very interesting, actually. It's it's incredible because they obviously don't have a prescription, um, but, but the way these work is, is basically reducing the amount of light that goes to your mm -hmm. eye, and so yeah. you can see. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let you carry on then <laughs> lenses are obviously really interesting to someone who cuts them <laughs> that's it yeah <laughs> uh the last slide i've got actually this is the last thing we're looking at uh, today is the retina itself now we mentioned it earlier on it's the back layer of the eye itself and its main job is to receive um the light from from the lens and, and through the eye um and the light that comes through the eye i should say uh it converts light into neural signals and those neural signals are then transmitted uh, to the brain, which is of course really, really important. And it's, uh, th these nerves travel down the optic pathway into the brain and it covers roughly around 60%, 65%, sorry, of the back of the eye and contains a mixture of different light sensitive cells. Okay, And these cells mainly are broken down into two sections, which are rods and cones. Uh, cones are receptors that are active in environments with high light levels and they produce photopic vision, so, so colour vision if you like, and the rods are responsible for vision 
uh, in low lighted uh, conditions and thus produce scotopic vision, which is sort of black, white, that kind of thing. Um, and it's made up of 10 layers, the retina. And we won't be breaking down these sort of parts into their, their individual layers. Um, not on this video because there's not enough time in the world to do that with every part of the eye. But again, if, if, the, uh, if the want for it is there, we can definitely do it for you. So again, just let us know. Um, but really, that's I've broken down the main parts, what I thought were the most interesting parts of the eye there for you. Um, these are the references I use just to, to brush up on my own knowledge myself. So if you want to do some extra reading on it um, yourself, Ooh, this lovely. is all there um, to be used as well. But that's... Uh, uh, if you, if you go back to the retina, sorry. No, go for it. Yep. Uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, only only because I, f I figured actually that's a really fit in site because uh, mm. we're going to be talking about uh, color blindness um, because yep. uh, obviously not today, but uh, the next the next video released will be about um, is it red green that are we going to do color blindness as a we whole? Can, yeah, or? yeah, whatever you want to do. I've got quite a lot. Because I, I think there's so, so many different types of so many different uh, sort of subcategories of it. Uh, mm. It might it might even be worth just going going into doing maybe the types of red green and then Perfect. you know so on yeah. sort of thing. I, I think color blindness is interesting, but then mm. I'm a bit weird about eyes. So um, <laughs> no, we can do that. Yeah, definitely. But, but it seems it seems fitting that you end on on a slide like with with cones because cones are. Uh, are actually connected to the color blindness as well, aren't they? No, um, we uh, can. I mean, even if you, we can open that up to the viewers as well, if they want to see anything or want to hear about anything in particular with color vision, just let us know in the next. Yeah. Well, whenever, just let us know, and we can. Um, and we can. Yeah, try and base so, as much around as what you want to see as possible, of course. Um, um, really, that, that's me breaking down the um, what I think is interesting and, and that the basics of the eye itself. I'll leave that image there on the screen. Um, yeah, I think I think that was I think that was nice because it it wasn't so in depth that uh, you know like it it was boring it's, to listen it's, to it's, it's and, a Monday and like as well, so we need to be in mind as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it obviously it obviously gives uh, gives people some sort of scope to ask questions about certain parts course, and definitely, definitely you know and, and then whatever whatever's most interesting to people we can do that next. Perfect. Um, perfect. Yeah. So uh, color blindness next week then. Yeah. Lovely, perfect. Looking forward. All right, to it. cool. Well, thanks very much, Max. No and, problem. Um, at all. Thank you. Yeah, that was much. that was really good. Cheers. Love it. Cheers. Come take care, buddy. Ciao, bye. You got it.